One of the inspirations for my work was discovering the work of the Bradley sisters many, many years ago um, when I first heard about restoration in Australia and uh, the idea of working from areas where the ecosystem is closest to its intact state, from areas of strength, is one of the key principles I've incorporated into the work of Trees for Life. So the work I'm involved in is restoring the Caledonian forest in the highlands of Scotland. And that's the native forest that used to cover most of uh, the northern part of the country, about one and a half million hectares at its peak uh, about 4,000 years ago. Now we've got just a tiny percentage of that left. Characterised by the Scots pine, uh, the most widely distributed conifer in the world, but uh, the conifer forest, the pine forest in Scotland is unique and different to anywhere else and um, it's also home to a range of other tree species and lots of wildlife and uh, it gets its name from the Romans actually who called Scotland Caledonia meaning wooded heights and for anybody who knows Scotland today you will know that there's very few trees left on the high ground. So why do we need to restore? Well this picture here showing a, a desolate landscape with just a, a stump sticking out of it I think sums it up. But before going into Scotland, I want to talk a little bit about globally too, because it's not just in Scotland that restoration has to take place, not just in Australia either, it's all over the planet. And this picture of the Earth from space taken by the Apollo astronauts in 1968, widely used everywhere because it shows the outline of the African continent, so it's recognisable. Most pictures of the planet from space show just cloud, but here we can see the landmass. And I think there's a deeper purpose why that is used, and that is that the um, prominent feature in this photograph is the deserts, the brown areas, the areas that have become desertified through human activities. So this is actually, for me, a picture of a wounded world. It's a planet whose capacity to support life has been seriously diminished, starting over 2,000 years ago when the top of the photograph, North Africa, was the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. And there were forests there full of creatures like elephants, which Hannibal, if you know your Roman history, your Latin history, Hannibal from Carthage attacked Rome with elephants. There's no elephants in Tunisia today where Carthage was sighted. So we've got a wounded world then, and it's not just um, um, Scotland that's lost its forests. Uh, forests are in retreat all over the planet. And when I started Trees for Life, I thought Scotland was a worst-case scenario with less than 3% of its forests left. But as I've travelled and learned more, discovered many other areas in a similar situation, the redwoods of California, the tallest trees in the world, 4% left. The famous cedars of Lebanon, from known from biblical days, less than 2% of those left. And then when we get to Australasia, we find the big scrub in northern New South Wales, tiny proportion of that left. Uh, the Kauri forest in New Zealand, less than 1%. Uh, dry tropical forests in Costa Rica, 2%. It goes on and on. So it's a global phenomenon. And most conservation work today, damage limitation, stop the destruction, is no longer adequate. We need a major program of restoration everywhere to revive and revitalize our fragmented ecosystems. So Scotland then has the rather dubious distinction of having been in the forefront of ecosystem destruction. It's been going on for several thousand years, it's not a new phenomenon. And many other parts of the world now are experiencing the same thing condensed in time. Here's a photograph showing the northern edge of the Amazon basin in southern Venezuela, gallery forest burned, and a comparison photograph from Scotland showing a standing dead Scots pine, you know, desolation in an otherwise treeless landscape. And if we come to New Zealand, we find the same thing, where the Kauri forests, some of the largest and most long-lived trees on the planet, have been reduced to a tiny fraction of their original extent, and the landscape is left as desolate grassland eroding with the occasional stump in its midst, just like what we've got in Scotland. And the new lands, New Zealand being one of them, New Guinea, New Caledonia in the same region here, uh, new lands, but they're all experiencing the same old story of uncontrolled ecosystem destruction and deforestation. We need a truly new story for these places and for everywhere else. And that new story is one that humans have never attempted to do until very recently, in the last 30, 40 years or so. And that new story is how do we revive degraded landscapes? How do we revitalize and bring them back to life, restore biodiversity? The human history on the planet is one of destroying ecosystems and people and civilization moving on somewhere else and repeating the same process.
So in Scotland, we've lost most of our large mammals, um, everything from the bear to the moose, the lynx, the wolf, uh, the wild boar. They've all been exterminated in the last 2,000 years or so. And of course, we find the same thing now happening globally. Um, scientists estimate we're losing something like 150 species a day, most of them invertebrates in tropical rainforests that have never been recorded or named. But some of the more large animals we do know have become extinct fairly recently. Here in New Zealand, the Moas were lost after the arrival of the Maori about 500 years ago or so. Uh, the thylacine or Tasmanian tiger, one of the most notorious extinctions in the world, occurring in Tasmania in the early 20th century. And more recently, we've had things like the pig-footed bandicoot in Australia, the South Island Pio Pio in New Zealand going extinct. And just in the past decade, it's not absolutely confirmed yet, but it's widely recognized to be true that the, the Baji, the Yangtze River dolphin, uh, one of the freshwater dolphin species in the world, has gone extinct as well. So this is the tip of the iceberg, but it indicates the loss that's taking place. In Scotland then, returning back to my native country, uh, what's happened is we've had this tremendous loss of biological diversity, and then human pressures are preventing its natural recovery. Because I think like many people, I recognize that ecological restoration is a natural process. The earth has tremendous ability to heal her own wounds. And we see this when volcanoes erupt or there's other large-scale dramatic effects. Life colonizes the bare earth and things recover. In Scotland, we're preventing that from happening. And the landscape has become equivalent to what I term an outdoor museum. We go to museums to see dead relics of the past, preserved items of life that used to be on the world. And Scotland is like an outdoor museum now. You can go and you find these exposed stumps in the peat of our vanished forest. It's like going to a tree cemetery or a forest graveyard. It's a landscape of great pain. So we've reduced it to this bare minimum, and it's then become paralyzed. We prevent the natural ecological processes of recovery from taking place. And an ecosystem that was perhaps 25 meters in height has been reduced to something that's maybe five centimeters tall and is being held there at a level of minimal biological productivity. That's what we've inherited from the past. And everywhere we look in the highlands of Scotland, we can see the evidence of that. This is the Upper Afric River, uh, utterly treeless, and the riparian trees that used to hold the soil in place are gone, and in their absence, large blocks of peat are getting washed downstream. You can see them in the left-hand photograph here. And the right-hand photograph, you see the blocks stranded on a gravel bar, and in the background, the ruins of an old croft. And people used to live in these landscapes. But in Scotland, we had a notorious event in the mid-18th century called the Highland Clearances, where wealthy landowners discovered it was easier and more economical to have sheep on the land than people. So the people were evicted, their crops were burned, their houses were destroyed, and they were forced off the land. Some went to the slums of Glasgow, our biggest city. Some went to Nova Scotia. Some came to New Zealand and Australia and proceeded to destroy ecosystems here. But the important thing from a Scottish point of view is that the connection between people and the land was broken just like it was broken with the native North Americans, with the Aboriginal people in Australia and here in New Zealand. So the people who lived on the land were forced off the land and uh, the connection with nature was severed. And that's really important because I'll come back to that a bit later. So in the highlands then we've got this highly degraded condition. Most of the forest is gone. Many species have been reduced to tiny proportions of the original numbers, particularly woodland dependent ones like squirrels and wood ants, to name a couple. Um, other species have been lost completely. All the big mammals are gone. And then human pressures are preventing its recovery. And those pressures are keeping large numbers of herbivores on the land, deer, which have adapted to their woodland animal, have adapted to a treeless landscape. Uh, sheep, sheep outnumber people in Scotland. It's not quite as extreme as New Zealand, but in Scotland we've got 6 million sheep and 5.3 million people. Uh, muir burn, the practice of burning heather to create conditions for grouse moors, because that's an economic activity, particularly for the wealthy. That burns any attempted uh, regeneration of trees. It's uh, waterlogging of the soils. And then ongoing nutrient loss. We've already lost most of our biological wealth through deforestation and extermination of animals. And the herbivores that are there consume whatever nutrients they can find from the soil and then their carcasses are exported. They're sent off to market, both sheep and deer.
and nothing is ever put back. Now one deer, one sheep might not make a lot of difference, but when we talk about millions of sheep and hundreds of thousands of deer for 200 years, that's a huge drain on an already depleted nutrient base. So the main issue then um, is that this imbalance between large herbivores and vegetation is preventing recovery. 10,000 years ago, there were no trees in Scotland because the whole country was covered in ice during the last ice age. And when the temperature warmed up, the ice retreated and trees recolonized, insects, birds, and eventually people came. The whole ecosystem restored itself naturally. It would happen today if we weren't preventing it, and that's by keeping too many deer and sheep on the land. Now deer, the red deer in particular, has, uh, is a woodland animal. It's been forced to adapt to a treeless landscape. And in doing so, it's reduced in body size. It's about two-thirds the size it should be. And more and more deer are living on the land. They're fed artificially. They've got no predators. Their numbers have more than doubled in 40 years. And of course, they look for every piece of woodland they can because there's more to eat there. There's shelter in the winter. So they've literally been eating their own habitat to death. For 200 years, this imbalance has prevented the establishment of any new trees. The old trees still produce seeds. The seeds germinate. They grow a few centimeters in height, and then they get eaten. And we've now got a 200-year age gap in our forest structure. And we've got away with that for two centuries because the existing trees were still growing. Now those existing trees are all at the end of their lifespans. They're dying of old age, and there's no new ones germinating to take their place. So it's what I call the geriatric forest. It's like going to an old people's home. Venerable old beings at the end of their long lives dying and no new life coming to take their place. That's what we've inherited. So these pictures here show the deer, a Scots pine seedling overgrazed in the middle, and the dying forest, the standing dead trees that we call snags. And if they die of old age, they die standing. And the wood has a lot of resin in it, so it preserves and persists for a long time. The snags can stay dead, standing for decades even. It's not just Scots pine that um, gets eaten, though it's all trees. Um, but when we remove the grazing pressure, we see a major process of recovery getting underway. These are two photographs here where all that's been done is deer numbers have been drastically reduced by intensive culling. And on the left, we see lots of lots of pine seedlings uh, germinating, growing successfully uh, from the old trees in the background. And on the other photograph, it's mostly a birch wood because that's the existing seed supply there it comes from mature birch trees. So it's very simple, actually, if we can reduce the grazing pressure. If there's a seed source nearby, the forest begins to recover all by itself. It's not rocket science. Inspired by that, I've developed the work of Trees for Life, and for me there's three main elements for successful ecological restoration in a Scottish context, and I believe they apply elsewhere as well. The first is that we have to get healthy vegetation communities re-established, and that's because they are the foundation for all other life. The vegetation absorbs the sun's energy and converts it into organic material, which can then be eaten by herbivores, which supply food for the carnivores and so forth. If you don't have healthy vegetation, you can't support anything else. So that's the first thing. Second element is getting the essential ecological processes which are absent at the moment reinstated. So those are things like natural succession, um, predator-prey dynamics, nutrient cycling, natural disturbance and so forth. All of those fulfill a vital role in a healthy ecosystem and in Scotland none of them are occurring. We've got this static museum piece landscape. And then the third element is reintroduction of missing species. And that's a particular issue in Scotland because we're part of Britain, which is an island, and species that have been extirpated from the British Isles cannot physically recolonize by themselves. They've got to be consciously and deliberately brought in. And in other parts of the world, that's not so much an issue. In mainland Europe, for instance, top predators like the wolf have been spreading, particularly since the collapse of communism. The barrier fence that used to separate East and West Germany came down at the end of the Cold War, and wolves have spread westwards. They reached Holland last year, um, but they can't reach Scotland because of the island effect. So we've got to bring them back. So those are the three elements, then, that underpin our work. Now, I first became aware of the plight of the Caledonian forest about 30 years ago in the 1980s. 
and I spent time out in Glen Affric, one of the best remnants of the old woodland, and I was touched by the beauty of the place, but I also saw that it was dying, and I kept getting this feeling, somebody needs to do something about this, because if no action is taken in another 10, 20 years, all these old trees will be gone. Why isn't somebody doing anything about it? And after two or three years, I realized, well, maybe the somebody is me. I can see the issue. I have the passion. Let's do something about it. So in 1986, I made a commitment at a big environmental conference I organized to launch a project to restore the Caledonian forest. And I think what's interesting looking back now is at the time, I had no knowledge, background, or training in ecology or biology. I had no access to land. I had no resources. I had no funds. Uh, on a physical level, I had nothing to help me achieve that goal. But I had the most important thing. I had the passion and the inspiration. And by then, I had enough experience to know that if I follow my passion, and it is really the calling of spirit in my life, I will attract the support and the resources and the people that I need. And that's been the history of it since then. So in 1986, I began a conscious process of educating myself, of going out and meeting people, encountering landowners, finding where could work be done, how could I get funding, and so forth. And it took three years for practical work to get underway. A long preparation time, but it's a bit like a tree. When a seed germinates, the main work initially is growing its roots underground, and it's a while before you actually begin to see you know, the shoot coming up. So there was a lot of work establishing the roots of my organization before any tangible physical signs of it came. But in 1990, I'd raised enough money to put up a fence in partnership with the Forestry Commission, the government, uh, the government forest agency in Scotland, who owned some of the best forest remnants, but had no money to do anything. I'd raised enough money by then, but had no land. So we came together as rather unlikely partners and we funded the fencing of 50 hectares, 125 acres, on the edge of a pinewood remnant on their land. And a study done by a student before the fence went up showed there were 100,000 pine seedlings already there, self-sown from the remaining old trees, average age 10 years old, and average height 8.5 centimetres. 95% of them had been browsed by deer. So we knew if we could put a fence up and keep the deer out, we would get forest recovery. And that's all we need to do. And these two photographs here show some of the results since then. The one on the left shows me as a rather younger man, uh, taken in 1992, two years after the fence went up. And I'm standing next to a little pine seedling behind my hand. And it was growing on top of a hummock, so it was a bit more visible than the others. And I started photographing, and I photograph it every two years since then. And the photograph on the right shows the same tree earlier this year, um, after 26 years of protection and it's now well over 30 feet tall it's been coning producing seed of its own for about 10 years accelerating the process of recovery that's the edge of the forest there the edge of the fence you can see but I think even more dramatic is this next set of images which is the same area but in the heart of it so the fence is not visible because it's in this, the center of the area and there were three of these standing dead pines these pine snags when the fence went up in 1990. The photograph was taken a bit before that. And you can see there, there's no new life around at all, but some old living trees in the distance. And the forest was really receding there, a bit like my hairline has been receding in the past 30 years as well. And the photograph on the right, you can see the snags are still there. They've virtually unchanged um, in 26 years now since the fence went up. But look at all the young trees that have grown up around them, a whole new generation of pines. And they've grown up not because we planted them, but because the seeds were already there. And with the deer excluded, they could come back by themselves. So this is, a, for me, a very powerful symbol. On the left, the dying forest, and on the right, the regenerated, revitalized young forest coming to take its place. We've been able to turn the tide of forest loss in that instance. Natural regeneration is the best way of achieving forest recovery. Let nature do most of the work. Um, but that only applies, in a Scottish context at least, if we've got a seed source nearby, old trees. And seeds generally don't get dispersed very far, 50 or 100 metres. So in much of the highlands there's no trees for kilometres and kilometres. So we've been planting trees as well started in 1991 and we plant trees in a way that seeks to mimic the natural distribution of the forest. So we look for the right soil conditions to match each tree species. We look for evidence where the trees have been before and the top left photograph here shows a good example of that. Our very first tree planting week in 1991 beside an old pine stump, 
uh, a volunteer there holding up a pine seedling by his tree planting bag, about to plant it. We know pines can grow there. There was one there probably 100 years ago, a good place to put one back. But if you look at that photograph also, you'll see very clearly how desolate the landscape is there. And all the vegetation is suppressed. There's heather in that photograph, which should grow to be about waist high, but at that stage it was suppressed to about um, four or five centimetres in height by grazing pressure. So when we planted the trees, we had to fence the area as well, otherwise the deer would eat all the tree seedlings. So the following two photographs show the same scene over the decades since then. And not only has the tree that that volunteer planted grown successfully, but the heather has grown as well and covered the roots of that stump that was previously exposed. So we see that um, protecting an area and stimulating the process of recovery actually creates a chain reaction um, of positive trophic cascades where lots of other things benefit and the whole process of ecological succession and vegetation recovery takes place spontaneously. This is the same area showing the fence line and these are the pine, the pine trees in both photographs that we planted. Now the photograph on the left has got mature birches in it and those have regenerated naturally inside the fence and the fence forms a very clear boundary in both images. Um, inside the fence you can see there's heather in flower, um, there's lots of young trees growing and outside there's only grass and stumps. And the photograph on the right is particularly telling because the heather's in lush in its abundance. There's bog myrtle in the bottom left of the photograph, which is an aromatic shrub, which is a nitrogen fixer. It improves the soils, um, but it's also highly palatable to deer, so there's none of it outside the fence. Didn't plant it, it came by itself. But outside the fence in that photograph, you can see what we call peat hags, those gaping wounds in our landscape where the forces of erosion have expose the underlying peat, brown earth, and in those we see the stumps of the vanished forest. So that's the painful landscape and it contrasts with what I would term the wild garden inside the fence. All we've done is plant trees and keep deer out, everything else comes back by itself. So we're looking to restore healthy vegetation communities, natural ecosystems, a forest that will look like it has been growing by itself. And that will be the measure of our success if in 50 years' time the people who come to this landscape then are unable to tell that these trees were planted because they'll be irregularly spaced, they'll be uneven in height because some are in better soil conditions than others, there'll be gaps, there'll be openings, it will look natural. That's what we're aiming for. And the vegetation recovery sometimes takes on uh, seemingly miraculous um, effects. This is an area here uh, in a series of three photographs in a very remote part of the Upper Afric watershed where there are no trees for several kilometres in any direction. And we found a tiny seedling of an eared willow bush growing beside the river. And the seeds of eared willow are very light, they can travel for a long way on the wind and it was heavily suppressed by deer. We put a small area of stock fence around it, probably about um, five meters by three meters in size, and the willow began to grow. But remarkably, seven years after we put the fence up, we found bluebells flowering there. Now, bluebells are a component of our oak woodlands in particular, and there's no oaks for kilometers and kilometers, over 20 kilometers away. There's no bluebells for at least 23 kilometers. How did they get there? You know, were the seeds in a seed bank there for potentially centuries? Because it's centuries since there was any woodland there. And once we got them protected, those bluebells multiplied. There was over a hundred at one stage there, plus other flowers. And that was a tiny, tiny little island in this otherwise treeless landscape. And it shows what can be achieved. And we find that um, even the peat hags that are referred to before, those most desolate areas, those open wounds, those gaping sores in the land, recover given time. The earth does not like to be bare. Anybody who's a gardener, I think, knows that. We go out in the spring and we weed our garden so we can plant our vegetables or our flowers. And what happens? Of course, the weeds start growing again because plants hold the soil in place. It's unnatural for the earth to be bare. So peat hags are highly unnatural and they're only there again because excessive numbers of herbivores prevent vegetation recovery. So in areas where we've fenced off peat hags, where we've planted trees nearby, we find that they too do recover. And these photographs here show that. The one on the right is a former peat hag. There's still a bit of a stump of a pine root 
protruding through there, but sphagnum moss, cross-leaved heath, uh, sundews and other plants have grown up and colonized the bare peat and the area has revegetated and it heals over time. We just need to allow the space for that to happen. So once we get the vegetation recovering, we find other elements of the ecosystem returning by themselves. Insects are usually the first things to arrive because they've got a habitat. And we find that the insects come and feed on the leaves and they bring their own suite of predators with them as well. Here in the top left, there's a photograph of the northern egger moth feeding on an eared willow bush that we protected. And the top right is a rather spectacular insect, a parasitoid, an ichneumid wasp, which specializes in parasitizing that northern egger moth caterpillar. It lays an egg inside the caterpillar, and the wasp larva rather grotesquely consumes the caterpillar from the inside. And those insects, of course, attract insectivorous birds, and the insectivorous birds sometimes bring seeds in their guts and plants germinate from that. So the whole web of life begins to get re-established. Bottom left there we see a gall induced by a sawfly again on the same willow bush. So there's a whole diversity of insect species coming back. That's the start of these positive trophic cascades that we see. Uh, we get these unexpected, unpredicted knock-on positive results as the web of life begins to re-establish. We've had a particular focus on aspen trees in Scotland because it's probably the species that has suffered most from deforestation. Aspen is one of our indigenous species, very palatable to deer, and it suffers from the fact that it, is, it very rarely flowers and therefore very rarely sets seed. It's also a dioecious species, so an individual aspen tree is either male or female, not both. Most of our species in Scotland are monoecious, birch, oak, pine, male and female flowers occur in the same tree. Aspen is individually either male or female, and because it spreads clonally, if you get a group of aspen stands, a group of aspen trunks together, they're actually all the same organism because they're growing off the same root system and they're all the same gender. They're all either male or female, and the next aspen stand might be kilometers away. So because they hardly ever flower, seed production is virtually impossible, and then when aspen is removed from most of the landscape as it has been, it will never get back by itself because there's no seeds. So we, pro we propagate aspen from root cuttings and plant aspen out, but we also protect the suckers because the suckers uh, grow quickly and uh, are highly palatable to deer, so they need to be protected. And this is an example here where we found suckers on the land that we own growing off the roots of a parent aspen tree, put a nettle on tree guard around them, and in 10 weeks the sucker grew four feet. That's over a metre. That's um, a tropical rate of growth. <laughs> Nothing else grows that quickly in Scotland. Um, but what was even more remarkable was that that aspen sucker in those 10 weeks formed the habitat for two species of invertebrate. Pterocoma tremuli is an aphid that specializes in sucking the sap of aspen trees. And it secretes a clear liquid called honeydew as a waste product. And that is the primary food source for wood ants. Uh, wood ants are one of our keystone species um, in the invertebrate community. They fulfill a vital role within the forest ecosystem. So within 10 weeks, by allowing just one aspen sucker to grow successfully, we had created the habitat for two species of invertebrate. So we get uh, this recovery of you know, other life forms as soon as there's a habitat for them. Uh, not just invertebrates, um, but here we see a butterfly, um, the green hair streak. Uh, the crested tit, one of our characteristic uh, particular bird species of the Caledonian forest, uh, recovers when there's pine forest for it. And the bottom left photograph here, very interesting. This is a, a sawfly larva feeding on dwarf birch. Now dwarf birch is part of what we call the montane scrub community, which is the ecosystem that grows at the edge of woodland when it reaches its limit going up mountainsides. The trees get smaller and more stunted in size and just before you get into the alpine environment you get this special band of montane scrub and the things, the plants, they only grow about waist height which is dinner table height for deer. So there's virtually no examples of this montane scrub community left in Scotland today. On our land we've got some of the best including dwarf birch which is a, a species of birch that typically grows waist height at most, but in Scotland it's highly suppressed.
and we've enabled it to grow by protecting it and we've got these sawflies, two different species feeding on the dwarf birch now, they're host specific to dwarf birch, not found anywhere else in the UK. So we've created a habitat for them. We find these ecological relationships re-establishing in unexpected ways. We ran an experiment for seven years on our land with wild boar, one of our missing mammal species. Uh, we weren't able to turn them loose because you have to get official permission, a very bureaucratic process for that, very complex. So we had them inside a fence as an experiment to see would they A, control bracken, which is a fern that has spread out of control because of uh, taking opportunistic uh, taking op opportunities from the, the fragmented nature of our landscape and would they also, the boar, fulfill a function in disturbing the soil and creating the opportunity for tree seeds to germinate. Within a day of having the boar back we found that they were f being followed by robins, one of our native bird species. And this is a well-known phenomenon in mainland Europe where boar have never been hunted out. And in the absence of boar in Scotland for 300 years, the robins have begun using a surrogate, gardeners. So when people dig their garden, the, the robins appear because they look in the disturbed ground for worms and grubs. So within 24 hours of us having boar back, the robins had remembered their ecological relationship and were following them around. And that particular winter when we got the boar, it was very cold, so you can see the robins got very close indeed to the boar, trying to find the bare earth where they could look for food. So. The next stage really then, uh, this final element of uh, the restoration puzzle is getting the missing species back. And we've taken some tentative steps to that in Scotland. We've reintroduced a couple of birds of prey, the sea eagle and the red kite. The, the front line is really getting the terrestrial large mammals back. And as a member of the European Union at the moment, uh, Scotland is obligated to investigate the feasibility and desirability of returning missing species. So there's been a, a five-year trial on the, the, the safe option, the beaver, a herbivore, uh, not perceived as a threat to people, directly at least. And um, that's been run. There's been huge stacks of documents produced about the effects and consequences of it. And we're waiting for a decision from the Scottish Government. Are they going to allow further beaver reintroductions or not? due in a few months, we hope. Um, so it's very clear from an ecological point of view that the beavers bring multiple benefits. They're um, a keystone species in aquatic and riparian ecosystems. Boar I've already touched upon. Uh, there are, in other parts of Scotland, feral boar that have either escaped or been released, and they're out there spreading. So we've got two of our missing species effectively back in the landscape at the moment, although their, their future is still not assured. But the crucial next step is not just um, bringing back the ones that are missing, but it's also ones who are still surviving in Scotland but are absent from big parts of their former range. So we're running a project on translocation of red squirrels. Now the red squirrel is one of our iconic surviving species. Scotland is the threat, the stronghold for it because it's disappeared from most of England due to being outcompeted by the non-native introduced grey squirrel that's been brought in from North America which outcompetes it for food and transmits squirrel pox, a virus that's lethal to reds but doesn't affect the grey squirrels. So the reds range has been contracting and contracting and the Caledonian forest is now the last stronghold in uh, Britain for the species. But in much of the northwest highlands, because of the fragmented nature of the Caledonian forest, we've got these little isolated stands of pine woods where there are no squirrels of any sort and they're geographically remote from the next nearest remnant and squirrels cannot spread over large areas of treeless ground. So these islands of woodland are bereft of squirrels and the squirrels of course are seed dispersers so there's an ecological function missing as well as a mammal. So we've been collecting squirrels from areas, red squirrels this is, from areas where they're abundant and translocating them into these fragmented, isolated woodlands as part of a, a translocation process rather than a reintroduction process to restore more of the full complement of biota to these depleted ecosystems. But beyond that, the next stage really is getting the terrestrial predators back. And in our view, we will never have healthy, self-sustaining natural ecosystems until we get the apex predators back in place. And work in other countries such as USA, where wolves have been returned to Yellowstone, have demonstrated the very tangible benefits that we get, um, you know, the trof positive trophic cascades that we get once a top predator is put back in place.
briefly just summarize, we've developed a set of principles of ecological restoration that guide our work. And uh, the first of those I referred to earlier, inspired in part by the Bradley sisters, uh, you work from areas of strength. Start from where the ecosystem is closest to its natural state. You've got a, a head start then to base your things from. Pay attention, number two, pay attention to keystone species, those species which have a disproportionate effect relative to their actual numbers. Utilize pioneer species and processes like natural ecological succession, and because that's how nature would do the job herself. Mimic nature wherever possible, and also replicate those natural processes. Recreate ecological niches where they've been lost. In many forests in Britain and elsewhere around the world, dead wood, for instance, is totally absent. It's cleared away, it's unsightly, and that removes uh, the habitat for a whole range of species in the detritivore community. Re-establish ecological linkages where they've been lost, uh, those things that connect one species to another, uh, like providing the, the aspen sucker growing as the habitat for the aphids and the wood ants. Control and or remove introduced non-native species. Very important because invasive non-native species are one of the biggest threats to biodiversity on every continent today. And we've got our share of them in Scotland as well. Non-native trees like Sitka spruce that are the backbone of our um, plantation forestry industry. We've got American mink. We've got Japanese knotweed. We've got rhododendron from Turkey. And the list goes on and on. So um, we spend some of our time controlling non-native plants in particular, uh, removing, regenerating Sitka spruce and rhododendron. You remove or mitigate the limiting factors that prevent restoration from occurring naturally. So that's a way to gain much more leverage if we can actually um, get the, the block out of the system, then nature will do a lot of the job herself. And in Scotland, that block is the disproportionate excessive numbers of large herbivores. So if we can reduce those, then the whole process will occur without the need for active, ongoing, intensive human management. Pay special attention to species that have limited ability to disperse by themselves. I already mentioned the red squirrel. Wood ants is another case in point. They um, reproduce by the winged queens and males mating in flight in the summer, and they disperse in the air about 100 metres. So if woodlands are separated by larger areas than that and ants are missing, they'll never get back. Twin flower and aspen, both other species, again, that have this problem. Then we have to reintroduce the species that are unlikely or impossible to return by themselves. Again, because Britain's an island, um, species that are totally extirpated, the lynx, the wolf, and so forth, have to be physically brought back in. Re-establish the crucial ecological processes that are not functioning at the moment. So that's things like predator-prey dynamics, nutrient cycling, natural disturbance, allowing perhaps occasional wildfires or flooding events to occur, you know, because that creates heterogeneity in the ecosystem. Let nature do most of the work. And then, perhaps most interestingly of all, it's not just how the work we do, it's the quality with how we do it, what I call the green thumb principle. This idea that, you know, somebody's got a green thumb, they've got a special connection with nature. Their house plants never seem to get insect pests. Their roses always bloom later in the year than everybody else. You know, many of us know somebody who's got a green thumb. I actually think it's not a green thumb, it's a green heart, because it's the quality of the heart that makes the difference. They pour their love and care into their work, and that has a nurturing effect on the life force of everything, and it makes a tangible difference. So ecological restoration is the work then moving into more of a human sphere. It's the work that reconnects us, and we need to become re-woven into the web of life just like everything else, because we've fragmented ourselves, we've separated ourselves out in urban environments, and most of us are denied our birthright of daily contact with wild nature. So engaging in restoration work, and most of our work at Trees for Life is done by volunteers. Uh, they've planted over a million trees so far and lots of other work as well. Um, helps those volunteers to reconnect with some of the most important things that we need for healthy human lives. So it reconnects us with the rest of nature. That's very obvious. It reconnects us with place because we have to know the place that we're restoring. We have to know the hydrology, the soil conditions, the weather patterns, and all of that. It reconnects us with life. Very important at a time when so much of our human culture is fixated on death and destruction 
violence and terrorism and everything. We need to refocus on positivity on life. It connects us with each other because volunteers come together from different backgrounds and discover a shared passion, a shared concern for the future of the earth and for the planet. It connects us with our own power. Many people feel like they would like to do something to make a positive difference in the world today, but don't know what to do. So coming and planting a tree, uh, engaging in restoration work, really gives people a sense of empowerment because that tree might live for 300 or 500 years. Restoration connects people with healing because it's an age act of healing a landscape. But in healing the landscape, we also engage with the healing qualities in ourselves. And we all need healing in some form or other. Restoration connects us with hope, a quality that's desperately needed in the world today. And when I plant a tree, it's a statement of hope that that tree is going to be there for several hundred years. And it connects us with spirit, the spirit of the land, the spirit of ourselves and the spirit in each other. Very important again. So restoration provides an opportunity for people to make a meaningful, positive contribution for the benefit of all life on Earth. And I think many people feel a need and an urge to do something. How can we change the world for the better? So restoration is a labor of love. It's a gift to future generations. My son's grandchildren will see the fruits of the, the labor of love that we are engaged in today because they're the ones who will enjoy the mature forest that results from the seedlings we plant. So it's a gift for the future. It's passing the world on to future generations in a better condition than we inherited it from the past. In summary then, there's one other element I think is really important to emphasize. Uh, I mentioned earlier when I started this 30 years ago, I had no training, I had no knowledge, no background, no resources. But by following my heart, following my passion and communicating that to other people, lots of support has come to such an extent that I got an email one day from a woman who was dying of cancer and said she had money, she wanted to give it to an organization that would plant trees and restore a wild forest in Scotland, had found our website where we interested. We got about £900,000 know, from that and that enabled us to buy 10,000 acres, 4,000 hectares of land to do a significant restoration project on. So that's the sort of thing that happens and I think the other real um, statement or example I'd like to have my work be not just restoring the forest but actually to share with people that we are very powerful as individuals when we follow our hearts uh, when we share our enthusiasm and passion it's infectious it's magnetic and there are no limits to what we can be achieved and I see this when I travel the world and I meet other people who are engaged in restoration work. It's not happening at a government level. It's not happening at a big institutional level. Most of it is taking place on a personal level. Individual people, local communities saying, hey, our environment's in bad shape. We need to do something about it. They're usually starting with nothing and they're finding a way to make it work. And that is how the world is changing. And for anybody who's watching this, who has thoughts about, well, wouldn't it be great if somebody did something about my local environment? Well, why not you? Because you're no different to me. You've all got the same abilities to do that. And I'm no more powerful than anybody else. I've just learned to harness my own passion and to share it and to channel it effectively. And each one of us can do that. And that is how the world is going to change. And that's how we're going to restore our wounded planet.